Welcome to the June episode of Silver Linings Talk Show. Today we are blessed to have Leslie Palumbo. She is a grief counselor, coach, author, and Reiki master. She guides people who have lost loved ones toward joy again. And, and some people may think joy, how, how do you get there, right? Well, we're gonna talk about that. Um, by changing the conversation around grief to include inspiration and empowerment. I love that. Love those words. Love that. Um, to live the lives their loved ones would be proud of. Well, that makes me feel good. That makes me tearful. <laughs> I know, right? That's a beautiful I know, I think, I think of my dad right there. Me too. Her speaking and writing focuses on the wisdom of grief and unexpected gifts and insight that come with this human experience. Mm. Welcome, Leslie. We are so thrilled to have you with us today. Thank yes. you. I'm so happy to be here. Yes, we are so... I feel like this conversation is one everybody can relate to, everybody can understand, and it affects people differently. And I think this is a very important conversation for us to have today with you, so thank you for being here. Yeah. And certainly one of our first thoughts that we had was, certainly what influenced you to be on a journey of helping people through grief? Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I, I guess it kind of found me, yeah. I will say. I think, you know, I'm in a helping profession in the field of psychology, and I think most people who are in that field are, you know, interested in helping people find light from the darkness. Mm -hmm. So that was really my general, you know, kind of direction. And then I had the opportunity to do um, an internship in graduate school in the Chicago Public Schools. And I worked with young kids in grief. Mm. And um, these were kids who were seeing complicated crisis type of grief pretty much every day. You know, they were dealing with loss. They were dealing with violent grief, uh, violent loss. They were, um, you know, brothers, sisters. There was um, gang violence. There was people coming into the school fighting over, like there were people bringing weapons to school trying, you know, it was, an uh, environment of extreme violence and great loss. Mm -hmm. And the thing that was so astounding as that I felt as a young woman was that these p kids had such an inherent sense of resilience. Like they had an ability to bounce back that I was like, what, how, what is it? What makes that happen? How is that possible? How is it possible that they can still see the beauty and the like the beauty amidst all of that um, pain so I became really kind of fascinated by the study of grief basically and what could be learned from those kids um, and then I you know and I I focused on grief and then in my own life as it does for all of us grief found me um, personally I was uh, I got that kind of phone call that everybody doesn't want to get that we all worry we're going to get and I got it on this beautiful Indian summer morning and um, I was told that my mother um, who everyone described as the woman who had everything um, she had walked out to the end of a dock on the Virginia shoreline she had sat herself down in a boathouse and she had taken her life so for me that put me in a state of such shock Mm -hmm. and a journey of very complicated grieving. So then I learned about, you know, more about personally how it affects, you know, right. even though I knew professionally how does it affect. So it was, it's been the study of grief, yeah. Yes. So you, you've kind of talked about some, some experiences. Are there specific lessons that you've pulled from these experiences? Yes, so many, but I will say with the kids, it started with the kids and it made me understand that there is something inherent about grief that actually helps us. And I think kids were closer to it. Like we as adults have more in the way. Uh, we have more mind activity. We have more in the way of what the natural process of life is. For the kids, the natural process of life was get see see all of it don't just see the pain see how beautiful life is at amidst the pain mm -hmm. so that also told me that grief had an intelligence to it as a process that there was something 
that if we didn't get in the way of it, like kids somehow didn't get in the way of it, they had this resilience, they were able to access that resilience more easily. So, so that was one of the things, yeah. And then the other thing I learned from, um, from the death of my mother was, again, there was something, there was something bigger at work that was moving me, mm -hmm. you know, through this process and that was landing me in a better place and that if I could tune into that, that was sort of key. Well, I remember you mentioning just specifically about the place and the feeling in that place, right? And was that kind of part of it, like the, the dock and the... Yes, right. Well, that, it struck me from day one how beautiful. Like, it was this beautiful, one of the most beautiful. I was up north when I got the phone call, but it was one of the most beautiful Indian summer mornings. Like, and I was like, how could something so painful exist? And something, and all this beauty around it. How could she have been experiencing such pain and be sitting amidst one of the most beautiful places on earth where she died and not be able to access that? So how do we access the beauty amidst the pain? And I think it takes a lot of courage, but I also think it takes open eyes, you know? Mm -hmm, so, sure. yeah. Absolutely. And first, just, you know, we are sorry to hear about that experience because even when you said it, 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 there was a kind of movement in my body yeah. that, you know, that yeah. Yeah. I, that, that's a very tough thing to experience and have to kind of navigate through. And thank you for at least sharing that piece because that is another avenue of loss is suicide. Right. Yeah, for complicated sure. loss. A complicated right. loss. Complicated yes, loss. many emotions and thoughts come yeah. and into that one. Yeah, and loss is, you know, we feel, and oftentimes it is unfair, right? It may happen through illness. It may happen through um, somebody losing their way and committing suicide. And so how do we make sense of that unfairness and still mm -hmm. be okay with it? And that's really the, the like, central task underneath, you know, processing sadness. So what yeah. helped you? through that grieving process? Yeah, so for myself, when I was, um, when that happened, I had been practicing, there were a couple of things. The first thing is I had been practicing mindfulness. So this idea that, um, of, of sort of holding awareness in the present moment. Because I think when we're in grief, you know, the past becomes incredibly painful. The future is totally uncertain. And really the only resting place is in the present moment. And I found that to be incredibly helpful, just to keep my attention on the moment in front of me. And it really helped with the overwhelm that comes with grief oftentimes. And the other thing that really helped was, um, was nature. Because the process of grief is a psychological healing process. It's part of the immune system. So it has its own intelligence. That's part of the system of natural intelligence. So for me being in nature was, it, it matched the pace and the rhythm of the process I was going through. Like it wasn't like this linear hurried world that we live in. Like, okay, we're going here at 12 o'clock and we've got to do this and we've got to do that. that. That was too fast and kind of stressed me out. But being in nature, it could sort of hold it and it sort of matched what I was going through. So that was also incredibly helpful. Mm -hmm. And also, I think to the sense, as I did that and I found comfort in that, I think having this sense of surrender and trust, like I can trust this process. You know, there's something happening here that's not all horrible and mm -hmm. I can trust that. And I think I'd, I'd love to mention too, I think you mentioned that you, when you were with your siblings, you were doing some sort of journaling? I was. And you they, know, weren't, they weren't I quite was. in the same yeah, like we realm as you were, right? Right. Yeah. We would go down to Virginia where my father was and we would all be together as a family and we were just trying to make sense of this senseless event, you know? So I was with my sisters and, and I would literally have to write everything down. I think that's where the book came from. But I right. couldn't stop writing because I could not... I just needed to make sense of how the paradoxes that are in, mm -hmm. that are in grief that you know it can be so solitary of a journey and it can be so interpersonal and so connected mm -hmm. that it could be so painful but there could be beauty mm -hmm. all around it you know all of these paradoxes I just wanted to I wanted to 
make sense of. So I couldn't stop writing. So they were like, what are you doing? I'm like, I don't know. I just, I just have to make this notebook. I can't. And then later I sort of tried to make some sense of it. But I love, I love that because that kind of leads into the next, like, what are ways people can process grief? And right. you were doing it your way while they were doing it their way. And it's kind of okay to question it because I think that's what helps lead people to maybe their way. Yeah, I think we all need to find our grief formula, you know, or our grief medicine. And I always think of it as like, you know, there's, you want to identify three things I always say that you can do in nature that calm you, that you enjoy. You want to identify two people that have your back during, in this way. You know, some people, when we're going through grief, it's such a hard thing to talk about. It's not something that we're facile with in, in this, you know, we're not facile with talking about death, talking about loss. And so um, everybody handles it a different way. So finding the people who, who can really hear it and who can help you on that journey is really helpful. Absolutely. Yeah. And you also had mentioned something about a grief goal. Yes. Like, which I think yes. is yeah. something that not a lot of people would would have or even understand. Or even think of. And, and, and yeah. everybody would be certainly different. I yes. think you're so right. Like it's, it's, um, it's antithetical or something. It's, it's, it just doesn't make sense that you'd be having a goal at this time when you're, everything just feels like overwhelming and you're trying to heal from it. But having a goal is so centering and so helpful and important. Can you give us an example of a grief goal? Yes. Like um, you want to make it something that is attached to a feeling that you want to have. Like, how do you want to feel coming through this? How do you want to feel in two years? How do you want to look back and see yourself having moved through this event? Um, and and how, how, it, how can it be connected to your loved one? So like for me, for example, when I was grieving my mother, there was, I said, I will find something beautiful in this, through, through, in this tragedy. I will find you know, the light in this darkness, so to speak. I will, I will find it. And, um, but other things can be connected to like a lost loved one's character. You know, like I will um, have this, these qualities go on because they were, they, they represented like the, the two best qualities, you know? Or for example, so like, I also uh, lost my husband like nine years ago to, uh, to cancer. And he was a person who was extremely like full of life and like maximized life. So part of me said, my purpose, my grief goal, my mm -hmm. kind of grief resolution at that time was, okay, I have to find a way to fully engage in life because he would have. Mm -hmm. And it like, it's honoring him in some way. So sometimes it can be about honoring the person. And sometimes it can just be a purpose of, Later, it can become a purpose of I'm going to have you know start a charity and uh, I'm going to educate people about certain things. Obviously, for me, it it has to do with educating people about grief. You know that makes me feel like it's connected to and meaningful and maybe makes some kind of sense out of people's yeah, loss. Yeah, I love that because that's kind of yeah. what I did when my sister passed. I said I'm going to help educate people on, you know metastatic breast cancer and and just spread because she kind of that was her wish in a yeah. way yeah and she kind of made that clear but maybe not so much yeah and so I kind of hold that near and dear to my heart as and I didn't really think of it as a goal yeah but maybe mm, maybe beautiful. it really is yes. that's beautiful. as honoring yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. that's so, true that's and and in a way thinking about that is helpful for me when I, when I miss her every day. Right. right? It's a place to put it yeah. all, you know? Yeah. And it helps ground you, I think. I, I don't know, but mm -hmm. that's a beautiful, that's a beautiful. Mm -hmm. Well, you just made me think honor. about it by yeah. saying that. And another recognition that you just mm -hmm. made me think about is my father had recently passed and my mother's going through her journey and she's got little things set up around the house, like she has the rings set together. And she goes, sometimes I'll put his ring on if my fingers are swollen and just wear it for the day. And she's set up like his picture, like little, little like altar kind of things. Mm -hmm. And I yeah. think that's sweet. And Beautiful. some people might judge that. And how do you, I would love to hear what you would tell somebody if they were coming to you and judging somebody for grieving in that manner. Yeah, I think it's, um, 
it's amazing how individual it is, right? Because yes. the thing that you could say to somebody, that, that a thing that you could say to one person to try and help them or support them in their loss might actually not be comforting to them. It might be comforting to me, but it might not be com comforting to you because we all have different ways and different right. microcultures Absolutely. about yes. how we approach death mm -hmm. and loss and grieving. Yes. And, and I always think um, in terms of think about the intent yeah. of your words that you're saying to somebody that you'd like to comfort or mm -hmm. that, you know, that you'd like to support. And then as you receive, as the person who's going through grief, try to remember the intent underneath the words. Because a lot of times the words aren't perfect. We mess up, we say the wrong thing, it's kind of awkward. Sometimes we say nothing because we're a little nervous. But if we think about somebody's intent, somebody's in intent is, it can be received kind of energetically underneath the words. Right. And that's really helpful. And then I think of if you're trying to support somebody, yep. I think, um, you know, the deep, really it's meeting somebody where they are not where you'd like them to be. Because sometimes right. we judge people, we say like, but I wouldn't do that, I wouldn't create an altar, I would, right. you know, I would be out running and just you know, not thinking about it. And look, those are both completely valid ways of moving through grief, but they're different. So we can't apply our own thinking to someone else's experience. We just have to try and mm -hmm. enter into it Absolutely. and listen. And I always find those people who are so supportive may have never been through it before, but they just know how to like really listen and be present to and, someone mm -hmm. else's experience. And I just think mm -hmm. noticing yeah. and acknowledging can be helpful to the person. Because yeah. if you don't, then maybe they could question what they're doing. But just saying, mm -hmm. oh, oh, isn't that neat that you're doing this? I think that's special. Yeah because it, mm -hmm. it's almost just giving them an affirmation or a recognition that, you know, hey, I think you're doing something neat, rather than mm -hmm. saying nothing or being critical yes. of, of it. Like, well, what did you do that for? Yes. Right, because I think, like you said, words are important. And especially during that first few years, that really tender period, not that anybody should judge what the tender period should be, right. but right. I think those words can be very important. I think it's interesting that you just said the first few years, because this is what was going through my mind, is just to kind of highlight also that there are many times people give support for a few months, mm -hmm. because it's, it's fresh in their mind also. Mm -hmm. It has touched their life in some way. And then we tend to kind of move on with our own life, our own responsibilities, everything going on. And the person who has experienced the loss may feel that they are kind of left. Yeah. Yeah. And I think like that's super important when we talk about support, is that support shouldn't be just the first two or three months, is continue to check in, continue to you know, go and visit, continue to make plans, continue to do anything that benefits that individual to be able to see the light. Yeah. Because when yeah. everybody leaves, that could make it where someone kind of slips more into darkness. Yeah, because it's such a solitary experience. Mm -hmm. Because it's, it's individual, it's mm -hmm. solitary, and yet, and we can feel really isolated when people mm -hmm. start to move on. Right. And we're still right. left in that inner journey. Absolutely. Right. And that that touches on exactly that, you know, what support looks like. It's really, it's not linear. It's, right. It doesn't have a time element on it. Yeah. And, and it's a lot of, like you said, Lynn, it's a lot of reassurance and validation mm -hmm. to say like, you've got this, you're on the right path, it's gonna get better, you're doing great. Mm -hmm. Like this, it's, this is hard. And you know? do what you need to do. It, yeah. It, it, yeah. Because these little things that you do every day in these transition periods, are exactly that or what you need to do and mm -hmm. validating that it's okay or it's fabulous or whatever words that that they you think they need to hear is yeah and I think people who are going through grief really deserve our honor and respect yes and our studiousness because we will be where they are someday mm. and every grief is new and every grief is different so you may think you know but each time you're going through it for the first time right. so a lot of honor and respect I think is helpful. Yeah. And what are uh, stages of grief? 
So, you know, there are the classic stages that Elizabeth Kubler-Ross talked about, you know, which is kind of, um, you know, anger, denial, bargaining, depression, acceptance. Those are like the five ones mm -hmm. that, but there are some things that people don't talk about as much, which I think ha are incredibly helpful for people to know. Again, the reassurance, like I'm not crazy, I'm just sad. I'm going through a natural human phase of development and everybody goes through it at a different time but this is something we all have to go through and i believe there's a purpose to it the purpose is to um, is not just to restore from loss the purpose is actually to expand some of the very best of our human qualities because we do expand our empathy when we mm -hmm. think about someone else in mm -hmm. in in loss we you know empathy compassion you know mercy grace wisdom, all these things. So, so in terms of understanding the phases of grief, the first one that I think everybody goes through mm -hmm. is shock. And shock is, you know, occurs with every grief because it doesn't matter whether we knew it was coming or not. We could never imagine life without the person we loved until it actually happens. We can try, but we can't have understand what it's like to not have somebody be on this earth anymore that we were so connected to. Right, yeah. So the shock comes and the shock is protective and it protects us from the enormity of the loss, but it's also very ungrounding. And it also takes a huge amount of energy and people don't realize, you know, the research shows that um, shock takes like up to 70% of our physical, mental, and emotional energy in the early phases of grief. And there are different levels of shock that kind of wear off over time. Mm -hmm. But 70%, that's like walking around with a bad flu, you yeah. know, 30% of your energy. Yeah. And, and so people don't realize how exhausting it is. And when they hear it, they're like, oh, that is why I can't get out of bed or I feel like I want to sleep all the time or I can't do all the things I used to be able to do. It's so puzzling. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that's one of the phases that I think is really important to talk about, and that actually is linear. Grief is so non-linear, it so mm -hmm. circles back on itself and mm -hmm. goes in waves and all that stuff, but, um, but shock is really intense, you know, in the first, you know, several months and then up to the first six months and then even lasts up to a year, there's a layer that comes off. People talk about the second year and how hard it is. It's because shock kind of ends after the first year, and so it can, each level kind of feels a little harder. But, um, but there's also something else that's linear that happens um, around six to eight months. And this happens so universally, um, and it's confusing unless you know about it. But it, it happens around six to eight months, and it's this feeling almost of backsliding. It's a feeling almost of going back to square one, like overwhelm and hypersensitivity. You know, it's like a feeling like, oh my god, wait, I thought I was doing really well. You know, and all of a sudden now, wait, am I not doing well? Am I not handling this well? Can I even handle this? Like, I feel like it's like I felt at the beginning. This is really hard. And there are several reasons for that. One is that shock wears off yep. at a six month mark. That makes Two sense. is just what you said before, Dina, that people start to move on from mm -hmm. the loss. People's peripheral people can start to move on, and you're still left in yeah. this intense internal process. And, um, and three is you've been at it just long enough, this new territory, this exhausting territory where you're kind of working every day with sadness and how to fit that into your life okay, that you're tired. Yeah. So like it all hits at that six to eight month mark. And I've kind of always won I've wondered and studied kind of like why does it get hard if it's supposed to be healing us, right? Mm. And I think it's actually because the hard moments kind of propel us forward into the future. And the purpose is to restore us, right. to be, be in the world again and be living in the world in joy. And healing can be hard. Yeah. Yes. So healing with, has stages. with that, <laughs> with those stages, I think yeah. you, had, you had something to show us on tools that can maybe help through these stages of yeah. grief. Yeah, I think tools, there are tools that can help us with all grief mm -hmm. and, um, and they're just, they're just helpful no matter what, but they're helpful every time we feel those sticking places. Those like, oh my God, what's, so we see, you know, see those so up confusing. On the screen, they have faith. Yeah, so the first one is faith, and that is, you know, we can have faith in change, like the nature of life is changed, that things will get better, you know. And faith can be, of course, spiritual 
it can be religious. Mm -hmm. And those are beautiful things if you have them. If you don't, it's helpful to try and find some faith in these other things as well, that life will change and things will get better. Mm -hmm. And faith in ourselves that we can handle this. You know, we can develop and expand faith in ourselves. Yeah. And then faith in grief as a process of yeah. restoration. And mm -hmm. number two is probably the hardest one, self-compassion. Self-compassion <laughs> is the hardest one. And it's yeah. the thing we really learn. I think it's the thing I hear most from clients that they feel they have more of after the loss than before and they're yep. grateful mm -hmm. for because we have to you know be okay with however we feel and we have to apply the same kind of kindness and compassion that we would to a friend you know and a loved one like we would treat often our kids or our loved ones really with a lot more kindness than we treat ourselves sure. and this is this opportunity to expand that and it's sure. yeah great number three and number three is perspective and that's seeing things from all angles. I remember when I was at the Grand Canyon and there was a ranger giving a lecture and he said, human beings have been on earth one piece of paper in the entire mile depth of the Grand Canyon. Hmm. In that moment, I was like, my wow. problems aren't, you know, there, there's more to life than my pain. Right. There's more about life when I, I look at the that. sky, you know, so perspective is really, really helpful when we can apply it like that. We just have a couple of minutes left, so yeah. I want to kind of jump into this topic that I think is so important is moving beyond grief to restoration of joy. Yeah, grief, really, that is the goal of all grief is mm -hmm. to um, return the return of joy and the mm -hmm. return of joy is brought to us by the process of grief, but it's a different kind of joy. So some people say like, I'll never feel joy again. You won't feel the same kind of joy. We're changed by grief. But the joy that returns is a kind of intimate joy. I mean, excuse me, more intricate joy. Yeah. It's an intricate joy that has deep knowledge of the opposite of joy, right? Mm -hmm. And the ephemeral nature of, mm -hmm. of joy and happiness. And we have your book up. The yes. Wisdom of Grief, and this came out of your initial journalings of just trying to understand your own thoughts and feelings, and then studying it and learning more about it. Yeah, it did. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. How about some great, great information in that book, for sure. Yes. Awesome. How about any final thoughts and how people you here we are yeah yeah so absolutely come find me on um the wisdom of grief.com and any kind of instagram but the but the website has resources for grief and how to move through grief Great. and what's going on and then my new online course which is called the blueprint for grief which is literally everything you need to know about every question you ever had about grief so hopefully it will be helpful to people. Oh, wonderful. I think so. Thank you so yeah. much for joining us today. Oh. What, a, what an important topic. Yes. What a pleasure. Thank you so much Thank for the you. opportunity. Thanks.